There was a perfect example of that during the trial. Dr. Behe was questioned about how if you change the ground rules of science so that supernatural forces needed for intelligent design can be considered science, wouldn't it mean that other forces can be counted as scientific as well? And in particular, it was pointed out to him that astrology, it was pointed out to him that astrology would fall as a science by his definition. And to everyone's absolute astonishment, when he was asked this question, he agreed with the assertion that under his definition, astrology would count as a science and could be taught in scientific classrooms. Whenever I speak to gatherings of teachers or lay people interested in education, I always try to remind them that the leading scientific expert in favor of intelligent design under oath at the Dover trial got on the stand and lo and behold he said that if intelligent design is considered science so is astrology. I don't think that's where we want to take the scientific classrooms in this country especially when we are involved in an international competition that will determine whether or not the United States remains the leading scientific nature in, nation in the world. I don't think teaching astrology in the science classroom is going to be the key to our re retaining worldwide leadership in science. Um, there's another point that you hear sometimes as well, and that is the scientific community is biased against intelligent design, and we don't treat new ideas. We suppress them. We keep them out. So it's only fair to put intelligent design in the classroom. What this argument overlooks is the fact that science deals with novel scientific ideas all the time. It's the lock, it's sort of the, the stock lock and barrel of science. It's the sort of thing that we love to have. So what happens with a new idea, with a novel scientific claim? Well, the people who back it go out and they do research. They subject that research to peer review. And peer review means you write, you come to meetings, you argue, you debate, you accept criticism, you do counter experiments. In short, you try to establish that your idea has the evidence behind it and that it's useful and eventually if you really have the evidence behind you you'll win a scientific consensus and then quite automatically these new ideas get into classroom and textbook just as an example six years ago the notion of a process called RNA interference as being responsible for genetic regulation was unheard of then all of a sudden the evidence be behind it began to mount and it is now clear that small interfering RNA molecules play a major role in development, differentiation, and gene expression. Textbook writers everywhere, and I'm one of them, are now putting this material into the textbooks. Not because state boards of education required it, but because the scientific community reached a consensus that this process is important. Now the people who advocate intelligent design like to say, we got a new scientific theory too. Be fair to us. That's cool. If they wanted to go through this process, I'd say, great, see you at the next biochemical society meetings, see you at the cell biology meetings. Let's look at your evidence. Let's subject it to peer review. But do you know what they want to do? They don't like this. They think this process is too messy and too time consuming. Their idea of how things should work is actually more like this, which is to be directly injected into classroom and textbook. And wherever they have gotten the attention of boards of education of leg and, or legislatures, they have consistently acted to short circuit the very process of science. I would argue then, far from being unfair to exclude this idea from the curriculum, it's actually unfair to include it without making it go through the process of review, debate, evidence, and experimentation that every other scientific idea, including evolution, has had to go through in order to get into classroom, textbook, and curriculum. Intelligent design, creationism, in my view, is not rejected, as some people say, because it has religious implications. I think a lot of ideas have religious implications, and they still find their way into science. The reason these ideas are rejected is far simpler. And the headlines from these scientific papers tell you exactly what that reason is. And that is that these ideas have been rejected by the scientific and the science education community for a far simpler reason. And that reason is because the evidence shows it's wrong. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. Now, I was asked a question that I sort of deferred earlier on, like, how do you fit this in with your religious views? And I told you that Colbert had asked me that question, and I figured I'll show you my answer to it. You're a Catholic.
Yes, sir. I am a Catholic also. Have you forgot the creed? Jesus, through him, all things were made. For us men and for our salvation. I remember exactly. all this very well. Okay. But there's so also... don't you see a conflict there? You've got to choose. No, there's not a conflict. There's not a conflict. There isn't? And you don't have to choose. And here's the problem. The biggest thing that the opponents of evolution have going for them is a fiction. It's not true. And that is the idea that evolution and religion have to be in opposition to each other. Mm -hmm. What it amounts to, in a sense, is that I have a higher opinion of God than the people who favor intelligent design. Because they think he's sort of a little pedestrian god who has a lot of cheap tricks. He had to design this. Whoops, it went extinct. He designed that. It went extinct. The fossil museums of the world are filled with his mistakes. My view is that I've got a higher opinion. This is a guy who was so clever that he set a process in motion that gave rise to everything on this planet, and you and me and maybe even Bill O'Reilly. You know what? <laughs> I, I agree with you about O'Reilly. <laughs> All right? I think O'Reilly could be so involved that he's one of the X-Men. Okay, now, let, 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 let me ask you something. You think God is that clever. I think God is so clever that he just made it look like there's a fossil record. So, so you, isn't God powerful enough that he just sort of put all those dino bones down in there to give us the illusion we've been here for a while? Well, in so, fact, nothing existed before I was born. So, so... Your, your theory is essentially what I would call the Steve Martin theory of evolution, mm -hmm. which is that God put all these things down here just to show us he's a wild and crazy God. Well, I don't reject that for scientific reasons. I reject it for theological ones, which is that I don't choose to believe in a deceptive creator. Um, Mr. Miller, will you come back? We've got to go now, but will you please come back on another show and explain to me this whole sun doesn't go around the earth thing? We'll work on it. Okay. Ken Miller. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. So I hope that's a more detailed answer to your question. Okay. Sir, in the striped shirt. Um, over time, like, uh, like larger mammals, they became gradually smaller as they evolved. Is there a reason for this? Or, because I was reading an article yesterday, and is there, like, you, we had like the giant sloth, and we don't have giant sloths anymore. Is there a reason to this? Okay, or? well, what you're asking me about, is there an evolutionary trend to make animals smaller? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I got a question for you. Sorry to throw the question back at you. What's the largest animal, animal that has ever lived? Anybody Not else sure. know? Blue whale. Okay, it's still here. So not all evolutionary trends reduce the size of animals. And it depends upon local circumstances and nutritional circumstances. There's actually a very well understood trend in ecology and evolution that when large animals find themselves on very isolated islands, with limited food sources and other evolutionary pressures, they tend to get smaller. And the reason for that, of course, is a smaller animal has uh, fewer metabolic demands, um, can get by with less food, and you might, might be in a limited area where that actually happens. But evolutionary trends go in both directions. They go towards the larger and they go towards the smaller. Um, so I don't think any one trend uh, characterizes evolution. And the persistence of the blue whale alive today, the largest animal that has ever existed, I think is a good indication of that. Um, right there, sir. Um, how long do you think it might take for the whole debate over evolution to be resolved? <laughs> how long will, do I think it would take for the debate over evolution to be resolved? My short answer is not in my lifetime. Um, this is something that people have been kicking around for a long time. And it's not a uniquely American debate either. It turns out there's a very strong intelligent design movement in Great Britain. Uh, this movement has made strides in the Middle East. Turkey, for example, actually, the country of Turkey actually surpasses the United States in the percentage of its people that reject the theory of evolution because there's substantial anti-evolution activity in the Islamic world. Um, I think it's going to be around for a long time. There are always going to be people who, for one reason or another, reject the theory of evolution in spite of the overwhelming scientific evidence behind it.